Everything is good. Let, let me. Then. So, so, for those who, who came late, so you, you can log in the computer with your ID number and then cursor with capital C 2223. And then to log in the supercomputer center, the same thing as yesterday, they say the same account and password as yesterday. For those, uh, for the ones who the, the account was blocked yesterday because maybe we could type three times the wrong way the password, they reset the account again. So you will have the same password as yesterday, but you have to change it the first time you to enter. Okay. And in order to avoid the overload uh, of, let's say, people working on the same server, please, maybe, I don't know, this part of the room, you can log in in the server, login one. And this part in the login two, for example. Okay, then we have all you remember the one And if it doesn't work, try login three. Okay. <laughs> okay, that's it. Okay. Okay, cool. So welcome back everybody. So um, the idea of this uh, tutorial will be just to give you a sort of ID gist of uh, an initial multiple spawning calculation. Um, I hope you should have received this PDF. Uh, you will see later on that it also on the on the cluster if you just need it. Okay. So one very important part is this little caveat here. So doing an AIMS calculation is not something that we can do like, like super quick, right? And have a, a, a good lover uh, overall ID. It's it it takes a bit of time to set up a calculation to check it. And then also to actually perform this calculation of a large number of Gaussian, okay? So during this tutorial, my goal is really to show you how we can do one of these initial conditions, so one of these trajectory. Remember like when we start within this independent first approximation, so you have one Gaussian and you just see how it spawns different, different new Gaussians. So my goal is really to kind of show you how this part is working, and more specifically to show you the output file, how it looks like, the kind of files that will be produced, and then to give you all the elements, elements that you may need if you want to then add, add more, more initial, initial conditions, conditions somehow converge your calculation. calculation. Okay. So so it's it's not it's not going to be eighty per se, but it will give you all the possible elements. All right. So, in principle, like the calculation that you're going to do, should just take 10 minutes to be right for the full one, one of the full, uh, for the one of these full trajectories. So, I expect that you don't have a real time to kind of just think about, think about what the process and kind of information that you have there. So, what we're going to do is to use more pro. I mean, in this case, I went for 2012, it's just for convenience here. But more pro actually contains in its core a version of the initial multiple coding code called FMS 90. So FMS 90 is a, is a code that I think is today the fourth generation that was developed originally by Tom Martinet. And that really is a very like, like, like extended code to do the spawning. You will see there's a lot of things that are quite interesting there. So we're gonna use that within more pro. So meaning that you will submit a more pro type of calculation but you will need to give the information not just about what Morpro needs to do, but then Morpro will say, hey, FMS 90, that's for you. Go and read the files and the information that you need for the phone. Okay? So a bit like what we saw during the lecture, there is the electronic structure part, that will be Morpro, and there is the nuclear dynamics part, that will be FMS 90. And you will see that this is actually reflected in our input file. We have an input for Morpro, with, with only the vocabulary that he knows, do a KSSCF with a given uh, with a given basis set or whatever. And there's an input file for AIMS, which is well, do your Gaussian stuff and everything, and you don't have to worry too much about the electronic structure that's going to be given to you. Right? So it's really the same kind of mentality as what we did. <coughs> so we are gonna do a simulation of ethylene, so C two H two. So the prototypical. Molecule here with a single double bond, okay? 
So this molecule, if you excite it, like the first excited electronic state, is an electron coming from the pi orbital going to the pi star orbital, which means that in the excited state, this double bond will be weakened. And what can happen here is that you may have rotation around this bond as long as all the distortion of the molecule. Okay? So what we're going to do is that we're going to do uh, one initial condition, like one initial collision, one run of the initial multiple spawning for this molecule here using CASSCF for the electronic structure and uh, for roughly, I think, 50 terms of second, which is enough for this molecule to already do a bit of funny stuff. Okay? So that's, that's the idea here. If you want some information about the adaptation and some, and some of the things like that, then that uh, you can find it in, the, in, in this reference one. Like that is kind of linked um, uh, under there. So okay, connect to the server. So this part, I think that uh, you've seen it. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna just drive you there up to a certain point. I will let you then do the work. Make sure that everybody is on board. Comments, and we move on. Okay. So at this point here, once you are in your home directory, hope you all manage to connect. If I may ask you to create just directory names. Uh, and to go in this directory, just for you to be ready for the next step. And then, once you are in your AIMS directory, you can go into the first step, which will be to get all the files that you need to launch the AIMS calculation. Okay? So, on my, on my home, uh, which is this one here, I have a directory called AIMS ref. It contains everything we need to run the calculation. So try to get all these files home. I mean, if you're home slash um, username slash uh, AIMS directory, if you can just get all this information. And if you do that, you should be able to see in your home that uh, in your new AIMS directory, like a series of files. And if you do that in your in directory, you should see these six files. Does that work? You have permissions? No big problem. Good. That's when you go and start. So, so what you will see here is this different set of files. So in, in the guidelines, I give you just a bit of an idea of what they are. But I think it's maybe worse like that we just kind of go through them together now, just for you to kind of have an idea. So the simple one, in tutorial the PDF, well, that's just the PDF of this, uh, of this stuff, right? No biggie here. Then there will be three files, control of that, geometry of that, frequencies of that, that are intended to be used by FMS 19. They are the, F the, the AIMS file, if you want. So we're going to come back to them soon. The file that you submit to more Pro is this one here. And it is maybe one of the most interesting input files that the world has ever uh, witnessed. I mean, it is very difficult to get this task, right? So it, it, is, it, is, it has to be like that, right? But basically, this file here. But basically, this file. Basil, yeah. one thing. Can you turn off your volume or disactivate? Um, I, I, I have. Um, your, yeah, I, mean, I, I have. Uh, the microphone yeah. is fine. I mean, the volume. Oh, the, the microphone is fine. The volume of the speakers the of the. the, the no, of this I think I don't know. I just can do that. Let me just check. I can do that. Let me just check. Um, because the mic is a fixed. Um, so you don't have a direct. Uh, I mean, uh, so I can I can do that, but in principle, it adjusts the maximum. I, I am at the maximum volume now for the microphone. Well, the microphone is fine, but I think there is a, like a second voice. Uh, maybe it's uh, our gotcha. speakers. Uh, ah, yes, yes. yes. Um, so it's yes. not the speakers. Is it because maybe someone is. Uh... <laughs> so your mic is, is open. Oh, okay, maybe that's problem. Yeah, you have two mics that is open. It might be that. Yes. All right. 
you, you broke my beginning of the of, of this course. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this, if, if you've ever used Gold Pro, you will recognize a few things here. But basically, here what you have in this input deck is all the possible commands that AIMS will ever need to calculate some of the important information. Okay. So first thing here, you basically define the wave function of your system with 16 electrons. We will consider three states, ground state, first excited state, second excited state. The information that you find here are about the active space that we use in our CASSCF calculation, right? Is a two, two type of active space, two electrons in two orbitals. That's what you can call it here. And if I carry on here, there are just a few other information, the geometry of the molecule, the basis set here, and then some AIMS variables. There's a lot of different variables here. And there are then comments, for example, this MP init, which will be used to generate the initial guess for the CACCF wave function. Then, then you have something, something called MP calc, which AIMS will be able to call to say, hey, Montreux, can you please calculate some of this information? I need them for my different Gaussians, right? And all of these quantities that will be calculated here are basically, let me just see if I can find them. Yes, there are a lot of different things in there, but you have the electronic energies. Do you remember in the lecture what we define as, can I erase part of this? Is it fine? Do you still need this part here? No, no? all good? So one quantity that we need is its famous electronic energy, right? At a given position. So this is what you will have here. But what we'll also calculate here in this part is the gradient. In other words, the force for a given electronic state I, so the nuclear force, this is needed to propagate the Gaussian classically, right? We need to have the force on the potential energy surface to know how to evolve our Gaussian. And then there will be at some point here, this part here, which is related to the non-adiabatic coupling matrix element. And these are these famous DIJ, right? It's non-adiabatic couplings that couple two electronic state via nuclear displacements, okay? And if you remember, these quantities are the only ones we need to be able to solve the equation of the, the application multiple spawning to move the Gaussian force here and to do the matrix elements where we add the electronic energies and the non elementary coupling vector. Okay? So now, basically, here what we did is to teach FMS90 how to request the information it wants out of Morpho. Okay? So here you have like different cases. It's long because it depends on the number of states that you want to calculate. Uh, but at the end of the day, what is kind of important to see that all the information will be read by Morpro, but the only things when you submit this job to Morpro that will actually happen is to say at the very end of the file, aims in the directory there. This is the command for Morpro to understand that it needs to do an aims calculation and it will find all the information in the current directory. So Morpro remembers all these kind of functions is ready to operate and then the addition multiple spawning part can start and Morpro will be ready to provide all the information that FMS90 requires. Does that make sense? I mean some sort of sense. <laughs> yeah okay. So um, this is kind of a typical you have a lot of time in this kind of things when you do addition molecular dynamics where you have a part that is responsible for doing the nuclear dynamics and a part that is responsible to kind of provide the electronic structure on the fly. Okay, so that's the way it's being do it, done here. Some of the codes have different strategies, all right? So then we have a series of other files. So we have a file here called geometry.pat. Guess what it contains? It contains the ground state geometry in both of our ethylene molecule. Then we have another file 
that is called frequencies dot that, which has a horrible format here, as you can see, but uh, also particularly with this very big screen here. But basically, it contains the vibrational frequency, the normal modes of your molecule. Why do we need the geometry in the ground state and the frequency in the ground state? This is actually to generate initial conditions for your dynamics. It has to be an optimized geometry. Uh, op yeah. Right, you know, yeah, exactly. And so, and at the same level as you're going to run the. This is, the, this, this is not so. The geometry and the frequency should match. That will be the optimized geometry and the optimized frequencies at the same level, cat FTF. Or if you want DFT or something like that, you want something where you describe well the initial geometry and the initial frequency. So why do we need these quantities here? Well, I did mention to you that we need to do this dynamic, this trajectory, see this trajectory stimulation. But I never told you how do we get the initial position and nuclear momenta for our, for our, uh, for our trajectory. We need to give that, right? Say, oh, start from this point. What do we give as a starting point? And that's gonna also come when we do the surface hoping tutorial, because it's gonna be the same question. So the way to kind of picture this, and I'm not gonna go in the, 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 the hardcore details on this part, right? The idea is just to kind of give you an idea is that you have your ground state potential here, okay? Of course, multidimensional, but ground state potential, okay? So that's gonna be the electronic energy for S0. And now here, you will have, say, your other state, okay? Your electronic energy for S1. So what we're gonna do here, as a way to initialize our dynamics is exactly what I told you in my little scheme at the very beginning of the lecture. Remember, we have a, a, an initial nuclear wave function in its ground vibrational and electronic states. And what we're gonna do here is to push this on an excited state. Okay, so we're gonna basically Put this here. What was a stationary state is no more stationary state, and we will have a certain dynamics. Okay. So, how do we do that in a world of trajectories? Well, the thing here, which is a bit of a tricky question, is how do we define position and momenta for a quantum object like nuclear wave function? That's a very, very big philosophical question, to be honest with you. And there is not a single answer to that, but there is one strategy that was proposed by Wigner in the 30s, which is to kind of calculate a so-called Wigner distribution. The Wigner distribution can be seen as a way to generate out of this nuclear wave function, a density, um, a phase space, uh, how to kind of make sure that I'm not confusing here. So what you have here is just rho of B of being a distribution that depends on position of the, uh, of the nuclei and momenta of the nuclei. In other words, you do a sort of transformation on your nuclear wave function so that you can obtain out of that a distribution of phase space coordinate, position and momenta, which is a bit strange in quantum mechanics. We know the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, right? Meaning that this object is very special here, but what is very interesting here is that it gives us a connection between the nuclear wave function that we want to push there, and basically the probability in phase space to have different, say, uh, different position and, and momenta for this particular system here. So what we do in a practical calculation, and once more, that's gonna be the same in surface hoping, is to consider that our system here is in a harmonic approximation in its, in its uh, ground state. We calculate the frequencies, right? Which will give us access in an harmonic approximation to this wave function here, because we know how to calculate 
wave function for harmonic oscillator is quite easy. That makes it's just a Gaussian distribution, right? So we can basically basically calculate for each mode of our molecule a corresponding harmonic potential for the ground vibrational state, from which we can calculate this Wigner distribution, which will be basically a distribution in position and moment of space. And then we can randomly pick a point in this big distribution that will give us a position and an associated momenta that we can then use for our dynamics. To summarize, if you give me the, the, the ground state geometry and the frequencies at this position, I can calculate within the harmonic approximation the ground state vibration, the ground vibrational state of the molecule. It's not perfect, it's an approximation, but I can calculate that. From that, I can very easily calculate this phase space distribution from Wigner that will give me a distribution that I can sample and from which I can extract different possible. These dots that I'm doing here are just dots that I can sample according to this distribution here. And each dot is one set of nuclear position and one set of nuclear momenta that I can then put on the excited states and let it go, okay? <laughs> so in other words, this distribution here will help me build this distribution of trajectories based on my nuclear wave function. It's not a simple context, uh, like concept, but if you want, the only thing that matters here at this point as a take-home message is, if you are on the ground state of your molecule, if you consider it as being harmonic, we have a way to sample trajectories according to this ground state probability density. And that's what this Wigner distribution is doing. The only ingredients that you need is the ground state geometry and the different vibrational frequencies. If you give that, you can, it's an analytical formula, you can actually express this Wigner distribution. And then by using some random number, you can select one specific set of nuclear position and momenta. If you change the random number, you can select another one. If you want to select a thousand of them, you will be able to reconstruct here this probability density in position and in momenta, okay? So just it as a way to generate initial condition for any dynamics that involve trajectories on the excited states, okay? So I really don't want to go to, into more details because at this point, it is not really required. Just see that as a way to generate a position and a momentum according to this distribution here that we can put on the excited states that we can use to perform our dynamics, okay? That's why you need this geometry and this frequency, all right? So after that, what will happen is that we need to kind of tell the ab initial multiple spawning, what you have to do here. So this is this control of that file, which looks a bit more regular than an input file for once, right? Where you have all the comments on the side, so the number of electronic states, in which electronic state we're gonna start our dynamics. So four total notations, so two means the first excited state, the ground state, first excited state, second excited state. Then uh, which type of uh, electronic structure method you use for your dynamics. And then here, something that will become important later on, which is a seed for this random number that will pick a given initial condition, okay? I will come back to that later. Then here, you say, how do you get the initial condition? Digna, meaning that full multiple spawning with the FMS 90 code, will expect to see a geometry dot that and a frequency dot that, that we can use to kind of construct a given initial condition to do the dynamics, okay? So if you put Wigner here, it will look for the geometry of that and the frequency of that, okay? It will build, yeah? And uh, the geometry you, you put in the multiple input, uh, which one? Is so, so this is in principle also the optimized geometry in the ground state. So the one that you have in the multiple input, it is just to initialize multiple. So you, you, you're not really bound to it, if you want. Just to kind of, for more people to say, hey, what's this molecule before FMS 90 tells you from the first time, hey, that's the molecule I want to calculate. Yeah, okay. Then here you have some information about 
the numerics. And you will have some parameters. And once more, we're going to come back to them. Let me just mention the time step 20 atomic units, 0 0.5 tons per second. Then the simulation time, 2000. So that's the 50 tons per second, roughly, that I mentioned to you. It is just like this term is just something for the numerical stability. We don't need really, it's not really an important one. Um, coupling time step, which is the time step when you enter into the spawning mode. So when you have to get, or uh, when you enter in the spawning mode, but also when you have two Gaussian that are becoming coupled. So you reduce the time step to make sure that you really describe properly the interaction between these Gaussian here. You will see that from the output file. And then comes some very, very important parameters. So this CS threshold here, do you remember this blue line that I mentioned to you, this effective coupling? The value for the non, the, the coupling, the measure of non hepatitis that will tell you to arbitrary, oh, stop. You need to start to, to start now the spawning modes because it is very likely that you will enter into a non hepatic region, right? There was a dashed line in my scheme for the spawning mode. That's the value that you have here. So with this value, you can completely screw your calculation. Right? This is a very, very important value here. All right. Then there are a few more numerical parameters here. The maximum number of trajectories, uh, and then some other information. I'm going to come back to this other information while we analyze our uh, output file. Okay. But at this stage here, so here you have a very, very brief set of information of what I did mention to you. If you want to have more information on the on the, the keywords that were used, if you can go on the Molpro website, so they have something here that contains all the keywords for, I mean, most of the keywords for the abinitio multiple spawning. And basically here, at this point, what I would advise is just for you to actually launch your very first abinitio multiple spawning calculation, right? So the idea here, is that before you will start to do a production mode where you start a lot of different initial conditions, you always have to run, say, a few, five, ten trajectories or like aims run to test the parameters. And this is a bit different from the surface opening. In surface opening, there is not so many parameters that you can define. You just run your calculation. You will see that with helpers. In the aims, as it is with no free lunch, there are a few more things that you need to be careful of. For example, this threshold to enter into the spawning modes, all these kind of things. So it is always good to sample a few initial runs to kind of see how the dynamics behave, to cry when your active space is going to break down and make your calculation unstable, but to see generally how things are working. Okay. So this is basically what I just want to do with you is to kind of submit this calculation and see what is happening. So if you check this uh, submit aims input file, what you will see is that it's 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 very simple because I'm just gonna submit a more focal calculation and I just feed it this horrible input deck for more pro, okay? And once more, more pro will digest all this information, realize that it's an, an aims calculation and call FMS 90 to take over and to do the calculation, okay? So please do try to submit this job, okay? And it should take roughly 10 minutes. Uh, so by what you can already see, try to look at the files that are produced because you will see that it starts to populate quite a few files around. And what we're gonna do in the, in the following is really just to take the time to analyze these different files together, okay? And of course, if you have any questions, just shout. Yeah. 
Uh, just can I just have one second of your attention? One second, just give me see. one minute. Uh, I just would like to kind of summarize where we are at the moment, right? What in the drawing you are being doing, you, you're doing at the moment, right? So, as I mentioned to you, we're looking at this ethylene molecule, right? And as you've seen, we are focusing on three electronic states. It's in the input file for AIMS, right? So, we are focusing on the first, the ground state, so S0, S1, and I also put S2 here, okay? So what we do here originally is to get one initial condition from this big sampling. So one way of initiating our dynamics, which will be produced from this um, big distribution in the ground state with the geometry and frequency of that. And then we tell FMS 90, you go and start from S1. Okay. In principle, what you would do is, of course, to do some analysis to know, I mean, based on the oscillator strength, so you can calculate the, the UVB spectra of your molecule and say, well, actually, the state that is absorbing the most, or if I send a laser on my molecule, the state that can get excited is maybe S24. Who knows, right? In this particular case, you take it easy and it gets one. Okay, but this is our choice, and I'm doing it because if you were to look at the oscillator strength, so how likely it is for this molecule to absorb like that, you will see that this state is actually pretty high, right? So it has a great chance that you will excite this molecule if you come with the proper wavelength in this given electronic state. So what we did then is to start our dynamics. So if I do this uh, little Gaussian here in a given position of S1. Okay, and this is our trajectory basis function one, the parent, right? So this is the one that you will see characterized by the alien file that is dot one. That's this one. It always remains on its one, never moves, right? So now when we propagate this one, what, what will happen, and that's what you will see, is that this will start, of course, to move in, in S1. Why did we put S2? So that's just a question that I got. Maybe it's interesting to kind of discuss that. Well, even though in this front coded region, so around the optimized geometry of the ground state, S2 might be far away. When this starts to do a dynamics, it is highly possible that this one can start and say hello here, right? So we want to give the possibility for the wave packet to possibly escape here and to spawn on S2, right? We don't know if S2 is going to play a role or not. So when you do this kind of dynamics, at least in a series of tests, it's always good to add at least one, if not two or three states, more than what you initialize your dynamics, because it might well be that your molecule will be visiting these states, right? If you do a series of tests and there is nothing, you're always far away, well, you can discard it. It's called group bone open -hammer approximation in this particular case. Okay. But that's why we keep S2 here. And also because it makes our active space for SSDF much more robust. But that's a detail. So, so then when this one will evolve here, what will happen at some point is that you will start to come closer to the ground state. And what you will see is that some spawning even may happen. So you will start to see some files with a dot two, dot three, dot four appearing. This little label at the end of the file tells you trajectory basic function number two, number three, number four, right? So you will start with one Gaussian. You will end up in this particular case, if you haven't modified anything, with four Gaussians in total, okay? So I just wanted to kind of make sure that we are on board. This is what we've been doing up to now, right? Uh, the the initial stage that uh, you start from, yeah. uh, you said uh, Molpro does the calculation to see which one is the right one? No, or no, no. So, so this is you. This is okay. absolutely on you. I was the number so, two in the... Yes, exactly. So if, if you remember um, here, we have we are the only one to be blamed for that. Uh, yeah. Is there? Okay. So we have, we have explicitly said we want to start on S1. Of course, if you were to do a spectra, you see that your molecule can be excited in the first and the second state. 
you may want to kind of initialize that once on one state, once on another state. You can account for the fact that your system cannot be shared in the mechanism, right? So, but this is a bit of a different story, right? It's really the preparation for your, for your system. Okay. Just out of curiosity, could you all send the calculation and it seems to be doing something that is not crashing? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> Good. That's great because we can spend some more time. So what I propose now, just be a bit curious, just browse through these files, see what they tell you, see if you can make sense. Have a look at the capital FMS out. This is the, the the big output file from the FMS part, and try to see if you can locate the spawning part, the spawning modes, right? Let's have a look at it, what it tells you about about the simulation, right? And I'm gonna just drive you through it after, okay? Yeah, FMS, uh, no, capital FMS the yeah, that's the, the main output file for the simulation. Thank 
And I'm going to try also to connect some of the things here um, with what we've seen during the lecture, okay? Just as you can see a bit more some of these aspects, right? Um, of course, if you have any question at this point, please just do ask, right? It's meant to be a bit interactive so that you can, if something isn't clear, just let me know. Um, I have no plan, as you will see very soon, right? So, so if you run the calculation, which I should have done somewhere, All right, so you've seen that we actually created a ginormous amount of, of things, right? So, so we have all these, uh, these files that have been created. One very important thing, uh, as it was recently in the notes, is the fact that you have a series of files that have the same name, but just separated by a dot, one, two, three, four. So as written in the notes, these files contain all the information for a given Gaussian function. So if I look at this Gaussian function and it's light, okay, this, all the information, for example, about the coupling will be in cup dot one for the first Gaussian. The amplitude will be amplitude dot one. The electronic energies, plus the n dot one. The trajectory, the, the different molecular frame, position, dot one, dot x, y, z. Now, if this Gaussian was there, so if this Gaussian in its life, right, carries on, and at this point here, spawn a new Gaussian that goes down there, so that would be my trajectory basis function two. This one, of course, carries on with its life. This one carries on with its life. All the information that this TDF2 when we call, will be written in two. They're not going to be the same, right? And it is up to you to kind of analyze in which state these Gaussians have been created. <laughs> I'm going to show you all the information is there, okay? But one thing that I will start doing here is to check out this uh, I was sure. There we go. Um, this fms.out file, because I think it's really one of the critical ones. Beginning of the code, here we are. You can see that it checked the geometry of that file. And then here, you have the thickness sampling taking place. So, this thickness sampling, once more, is just to try to create an approximate phase space distribution for your nuclear wave function at time t0, your molecule when it's stationary and quiet and has that nothing to anybody, right? Before you're excited on the on, on the excited state and try to sample a set of position and a set of momenta 
from which you can initialize your spawning dynamics. And this FMS 93 will do it automatically, creating all the initial conditions that you need for your dynamics. Then it tells you some information. And here it summarizes some of the important parameters of your dynamics, number of electronic states, the maximum number of trajectories. And here, something that is quite interesting, the particle, what is particle is the atoms that are composing your molecule. Particle number one is a carbon, atomic number, the width, finally, it's width. You remember the alpha, the width of the Gaussian associated with the carbon. Alpha is multiplying R minus R0. If, if uh, alpha is large, the Gaussian is skinny, skinny, okay? If alpha is small, the Gaussian is a bit broader, okay? This width has been defined in a rather straightforward manner by comparing the width that you would have here in Cartesian coordinates, all the things that we are doing is in Cartesian coordinates, with width that you can determine from normal mode analysis of different atoms in different bonding pattern. So did a paper on that, which was kind of, hey, there you go. This is the width that we can measure. This is the viability of the width that you would have for different set of molecules. And within this viability, well, most of your property won't change much. So this is how this width has been accepted and defined there in the following way. If you are, if you have a molecule that has no width put there, then you need to determine this width. But for carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, and some other ones, they've been defined. So you can just use them and you don't need to kind of worry about that. Okay. As I mentioned to you, FMS 90 will have sample a set of position and nuclear momentum. This is always for the carbon, right? So of course, the position of the, of of the carbon atom at time T0 is defined by three coordinates. The same for the momenta vector, okay? So that's the coordinates of this. And then you move on to the other particles. So second particles is also a carbon. Third particle, hydrogen. Hydrogen, smaller, lighter. So you will expect that it's more quantum, as we say, right? And yes, the width is smaller because this is slightly more broad, okay? So again, position, momentum, and so on, and so on, and so on. And then basically here, you start your dynamics. It's just listing the steps. So time step zero, uh, sorry, step, uh, time zero, time step 20, you have one trajectory, one Gaussian. Trajectory here means Gaussian, trajectory basis function, okay? And then you carry on, quite boring, right? Nothing really exciting happen until, Boom, something mega cool here. Okay. So here, this is one thing that I quite like with this FMS 90 code, is the fact that for each step, what it will do is to kind of check the character of your electronic states to try to detect whether you may, within a 20 atomic unit time step, which is quite big, if you may have jumped over a possible intersection, right? <laughs> So, um, uh, and here, what it, it, it detected at this point is that, oh, maybe we need just to be a bit more careful in this position. And more importantly, at this time here, time uh, 560, you see that you enter into this famous spawning mode. So what happens here is that your first Gaussian here that is evolving, you've been monitoring at every step, I'm gonna show you that because it's in an output file, this effective coupling with the other states, okay? At this time step, 560, what happens is that the parent Gaussian said, hey, wait a second, the effective coupling that I measured is above the threshold. We stop everything, we enter into the spawning mode. Do you remember the step of the spawning mode? We forget about the propagation of this C coefficient, this C amplitudes, and we just propagate this Gaussian classically, right, with a small time step. And we try to determine whether we have to spawn a new function. It's exactly what's going to happen here. So what you see here is that spawning trajectory one exceed th exceeded threshold. And then you see a parent on stage two. 
this guy here, is wondering whether life should happen on state one. Okay. And what you see here is the step here in this phonic mode that I described to you before. Okay. So you have this propagation in time 565, 70, 75, 80. And here, this is this effective coupling. Do you remember? We set it to 3.0 in the input file. First value 3.04. Yes, you went above this value. That's why you enter in this phonic mode. It makes sense, right? Now you carry on the dynamics. And you see that it's increasing, 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 decreasing. This is the maximum, 595. Okay. Then here, this overlap is just a measure to make sure that if you have a parent Gaussian and you create in position a Gaussian just under it, that they will overlap. Why do you do that? Simply because the Gaussian are overlapping not just in position state, but in phase state. And what you do with your Gaussian is that when you push it, when you have your parent Gaussian, instead of using my hand, I would use the choke. It's going to be much simpler, right? So, so say if you are in this particular case here, when your parent Gaussian here wonders if you need to create another Gaussian here. This little energy gap in potential energy, what you usually do to conserve the total energy of your system is to rescale the velocity, the momenta of the child Gaussian function, such that all your Gaussian have roughly the same total energy. Okay. If you rescale this, in particular along the coupling vectors, it means that you slightly perturbed the, the, the direction of the momenta. The overlap of this Gaussian that I showed you before. Is not just an overlap in position space, it's an overlap in phase space, right? So it needs to overlap with respect to the position and with respect to the momentum. If this energy gap might be big, it might well be that even though these Gaussians are at the same position, they don't overlap because the momenta are not the same and they mess up with your overlap. This is what this overlap here is checking. But as you can see, the overlap at this maximum is 87%, massive overlap. So what happens here? Spoon successful. Child is created at 595. This is the drawing here. We just create a child at 595, okay, where we have the maximum of this coupling. And then, as I mentioned to you, what are we going to do here? Well, we propagate the child backward, okay, in time. So 595, 590, 585, and nah, 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 nah. And you bring it here at, uh, at 565, which is the time where we initiated the spawning mode. Okay. So, as we said before, when you start here, this, this spawning mode, you just have a look where you can spawn your Gaussian. You spawn a new Gaussian here, but then you back propagate to restart the dynamics where you stopped it in the spawning mode. You need to bring the child back at this time because now you want to consider a new function. And this is exactly what you do here at this time. Forget the mark for that. I'm going to explain you what it means. At 565, which is where we stop before the spawning mode, we restart now the dynamics with two trajectories. Okay. And we have a time step that's a bit smaller now to kind of make sure that as they are starting to kind of talk to each other, they do it in the best possible way. It's a smaller time step. So we describe well the scoping that they have. Okay. <laughs> and now we carry on. We carry on, we carry on. This is two Gaussian, right? So if you if you had a measure of the time, now it takes more time because you have to propagate one Gaussian, the other Gaussian centroid position. One Gaussian, other Gaussian centroid position. I'm gonna show you that just later on. So and this is what's happening there. And then at some point, poof. Again, we have a new spawning. Again, the parent wants to spawn a new function, right? So same process here. Find the maximum of the coupling, which is a bit smaller here. But again, a new function is created, backpropagate it, and now we have three trajectories. So for each step of your dynamics, you basically have to do six electronic structure calculation, okay? And you carry on, and you carry on, and you carry on, and you carry on. 
Okay. Then at the end, uh, what you will have is that you will finalize here your dynamics after 2000 uh, atomic units. What you will realize is that some trajectories have been marked for death or removed. This is a numerical trick. The idea is that once, once a Gaussian here arrives on the ground state, this Gaussian, what will happen is that it will very rapidly leave the coupling region. So if our goal is just to see how fast we can push amplitudes down towards a ground state, what we may want to do is that once a Gaussian is on the ground state and no more at all interacting with the other Gaussian, we just basically park it, we just stop it. Because then we don't have to worry about it, we don't need to calculate information for this Gaussian. Moreover, the problem of this Gaussian here is that when you arrive on the ground state, very, very often what you will have is that when you have the Gaussian arriving on the ground state, it will be in a weird distorted geometry from the excited state. And when you arrive on the ground state, it's going to just fall down towards the minimum, acquiring the, you know, what I want to say, a shitload of, <laughs> very true, of kinetic energy, right? Uh, famous units, the shitload. Uh, so, so and, and that would actually means that you may have numerical instabilities because to integrate properly the equations of motion, you need to reduce the time step. Who cares? If the is on the ground state, we can always run it later on if we want, as we did for the other example that I showed. Okay, does that make sense for this part? You can see here the spawning modes, right? In this particular case. So let's have a look at some of these files now. I haven't tested a new plot. I hope it's gonna work. Um, so first thing that I want to do is to plot um, I'm gonna just plot all the lines from the pot en dot one the electronic energies along the trajectory basis function one. Uh, uh, three. Oops. Four. I could have been a bit more prepared, but that's live, right? And five. There we go. This is that for real. Okay, so what you see here are the different electronic energies along the trajectory physics function one that is evolving on the first excited state. Okay, in other words, what you see here, so you have ground state, first excited state, second excited state, this straight line. Yes, it's straight, perfect. Total energy, perfectly conserved, right? Um, and then what you have here on the x-axis is time. It's not a coordinate, right? It's not a stretch, it is time, all right? So the trajectory that we are interested in is evolving on this state here all the time. It never changes, right? It always remember that, it always remains there. Now, look at something quite funny. This, the ground state is there. Immediately after the dynamics, the ground state shoots up, right? Why? Because the molecule on S1 may start to do a motion that on S1 is no problem. You can do it. It's even downhill in energy. But if you were to consider the ground state energy, where you have, for example, double bond, that's Super destabilizing in terms of the energy. Remember the shape of the molecule? We said that this molecule is this is this ethylene molecule here. You have a double bond in the ground state. If you excite this molecule in S1, this double bond becomes bigger, meaning that I can stretch this bond, twist this bond on the excited state. Who cares? That doesn't cost much energy, right? But if you look at the corresponding energy on the ground state, huh, that's a bit harder, right? So that's why this ground state shoots up in energy because now I mean the molecule is being like crazy stuff on S1. Yeah. Uh, here, are we concerned about the rotational stuff because it is also rotating, I mean, the molecule. So, in between um, the rotational levels, are we so, not giving any information? No, no. J equals zero. 
Okay. Yeah. Uh, no. the, G, the rotation and number. No? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But look at there. Look at this position here. Here, there is a moment where F1 comes next to the ground state. And this is just a bit after 500. This is where we have the first fold. You remember? It, can someone tell me like what was the, the value the, the time for the first phone? Yes. Yeah. Roughly there. What was the second one? How much? About 1,000. About 1,000? Well, no doubt about that. Look at that, right? <laughs> and let me guess, there is something around 2,000 also, right? Yeah, there we go, okay? So you see every time this Gaussian say, hey, hello, it's zero, four, it's four. Okay, so you can really see it from there. Now, funky part is actually what I'm going to do in this part here is to add on top. That's going to be a tiny bit messy, but I'm going to add on top of that the potential energy for the second Gaussian, the one that we created here. Okay, and that's quite cool. I mean, I'm saying that hopefully. Huh. Mega messy. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think it's the worst possible color in the world. And I am colorblind. So it's. Uh, <laughs> um, let me just. Yeah, it doesn't really help, right? Okay. You will have just. Trust me. Sorry, just one second. So. This curve, this curve that we have here is the original ground state for this Gaussian, okay? Which is corresponding S1 for this Gaussian. Now, look in this region here. You have a barely invisible line here yeah? that is the ground state energy for the Gaussian we just created on the ground state. And what you will see here is that at this point, all these energies are exactly the same. It makes sense because that's how we deal with the spawning mode. The spawning mode, we have the perfect overlap of the two Gaussian at the spawning time. They should have exactly the same energy, right? For F1 and S0. Of course, one is evolving on S1, the other is evolving on S0. But if you were to kind of think of the energy as they are perfectly overlapping in position, they should have exactly the same energy. That's what you see here. But then this new tail that you see here is the backpropagation. And you see that the backpropagation is deviating from the one of the original parent Gaussian. That makes sense because this one was evolving in the zero, right? In the backpropagation. And then what you can see here is that this trajectory on S on the ground state is then doing a sort of little dance here, right? And the energies of the corresponding S1 state is now going up because now the dynamics is driven by this barely invisible state that you have here. Okay. But basically, what you see here are the traces of the different Gaussian. If, if I wanted just to show you only the active states for each Gaussian, I would have to do so. For the first Gaussian is on this state. The second Gaussian is on the ground state. The third Gaussian, which is the only one that will matter in this case, is on the ground state. So this, if you want, is the electronic trace of all the Gaussian that you've generated in the dynamics, right? So there is the parent one that's always there. Then we have this one that is kind of going around here. Then we have later on this one, right? And you see that this one, as soon as it's done here, is a mean you know, going back to the ground state. Like you can imagine that if it's drifting with a curve coming back, right? So these are all the Gaussian that will be talking to each other, right? During this dynamics. There's a fourth one that is just at the end. I don't bother with that. Okay. Does that make sense? Somehow. Yeah. Okay. So if you want more information about the spawning. No. 
there we go. Um, here, if you go to spawn.log, spawn.logs contains uh, horrible format. Um, so it's just for this, the size here, but it contains basically all the information about when you spawn and where. Personally, I prefer to look directly from the spawn dot two file. Spawn dot two is an XYZ file that contains the geometry when the spawn took place. So if you look at it, it's gonna be most likely a molecule like me, like in a weird shape, right? That is kind of connecting next to the intersection. But what's important is that in the command line of this XYZ file, you will see it. at 595 spawning time, you go in state one and you come in for the trajectory basis function one that was in state two. Okay, so it's coming from trajectory one that's on state two, and this is actually going to be evolving on state one. So every time you look at this on the in this file, you know exactly where your Gaussian are evolving. So if I grab state in the spawn file, so spawn two, B four. Wait, I'm going to just do that for you to see it better, and for me to have to jump. Um, Spawn two, three, four. You have the times of each of these spawns, and you see that they are all coming from trajectory one. None of them have spawned at other time. They've all been so it's been trajectory one that has been one, two, three, right? It's really what happened here. It's not always the case, right? Sometimes you can have crazy amount that is spawned by the child, and then you don't know who's the parent. That's a mess. Um, but you, you, yeah. It, it looks a bit like it's a bit too much close to life sometimes. So so yeah, so so this is really this kind of organic tree that is evolving here. So in this particular case, you only have four spawns. That's a good one, right? Sometimes you have 20 spawns, right? So then this file become very handy because if you want to do some analysis of these Gaussian, you really need to know where they are, where they're coming from, and what's happening with their life, right? Speaking of which, so what is this C coefficient for this Gaussian? They are given in the M dot something file. So you have time, and here you have here the, the, the real and the imaginary part, which is kind of a complex, I'm afraid, but this is kind of the norm of, of this population. And you see that for the M dot one, the coefficients on the first trajectory basis function, the norm is equal to one. And guess when this is going to change in time? Okay, 500 something, right? Yoo <laughs> there we go. Okay. You see that there is a mess happening here. And this one loses almost 60% of its population. Okay. Then it gets happy with its life until it meets another kid who is living with other part of the money. <laughs> and, and then a third one, but you can see really these amplitudes being removed. Now, one thing that is very important that this file here, when I'm, I'm giving you this file, it is actually here, the coefficient, right? So it's the coefficient so this one is on S1, right? Of say the Gaussian one over time. And this is the norm, okay, of that. This term, which is the, the I mean, the, the coefficient that multiply the Gaussian is not the same as the electronic population. Very important to realize that. Gaussians form a non-orthogonal set of basic function. That sounds fancy, but it's an absolute pain. Why? Because it means that if you do at every time step, just that's a little script ID, right? Like add all these coefficients squared for all the Gaussian at a given time. It's not gonna be one. It might be higher than one. Why? Because as these Gaussian are non orthogonal you need to account for the interference term between the Gaussian. It's something that people in quantum chemistry are very used to, right? But the thing is that this, looking just at this C squared here, is not a good way to look at the population of a given state. In the ab initial multiple spawning, 
you always need to express your quantities based on expectation values, expectation values of the full molecular weight function. And that's the only way where you can really get quantities that really reflect all the information that you have in your, in your calculation, right? So um, I have somewhere um, here. So this is part of a book, the book chapter that I mentioned to you. Um, so I do have here some uh, equation here. So it's, it's just the full equation here. But what I just would like to show you is that the population on a given state, uh, lambda, don't ask for the, the labeling here, okay, is basically the product of the coefficient times the overlap between the Gaussian function. If this overlap, oh, let me lower, uh, if this S, the overlap was an identity, I, right, because we had an orthogonal basis, then all of diagonal terms will be equal to zero, and we'll have that the sum of the C squared would be equal to the population. As the Gaussian functions are not orthogonal, then we have to account for this F term. Okay. And this is what takes me to the comparison between what we have in the M file and the N dot dat file. Why need, did I move it? Yeah, most likely. So the N dot dat file, I'm going to plot it. There we go. This is the actual population for one at the instrument corresponding run. In principle, you would have to do 30, 40 runs and you average quantity of all of them, right? This would be the population decay that I showed you for the sulfine for vitamin D, right? But this here is the actual decay. You see, we start uh, end of that. So the label now of these of these different curves are really the electronic state. This is the information that you collected from all the Gaussian. You remove the information, you bring all the information from the Gaussian, and you now calculate and ask what is the electronic state population out of my AIMS calculation. This is really summarizing all the information from the Gaussian. And you see that we start with the state in the wonderful blue plot for the third column, which is times S0, S1. So that's S1, the green curve that falls. At around 500. Hey, it was we had the first phone. Then you have to be slight again at a thousand on the phone. And then, okay, just shut here. Okay. This is the actual population. This is the value you want to use if you want to kind of look at quantities for this kind of thing. Now, again, just overlap on top. There's a moment where you have to shoot me, right? Because I can talk about that for three hours, right? So, um, <laughs> Maybe one Rogan should be at some point. Um, uh, with line, line with, okay, let's make it big. Thank you. Uh, no, that's fine. That is normal. Uh, because there's only one population per amplitude file. J just to make the brain messed up. <laughs> so what you have here now, I just put this end of that, which is the actual population, and I superimpose the population of each of our Gaussian file, right? So what you will see is that, so if I look at the amplitude two, which is the C squared on the Gaussian number two, that is on the ground state. And what you see here is that it's zero at the beginning, but basically it doesn't exist, right? And then suddenly it's there. And then this one is basically stable because it always carries the same amount, right? Now we see that there is here some more population that is going back to the ground states. If I want to see this one, what I would need to do is to bring the second child that has been spawned Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's the wonderful, amazing color. Which is there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just this little quantity here. Now add this there. And you see that we brought this amount to the ground states. 
plus this amount to the ground state, you will get to this curve here. Okay. Now you don't really see it because it's the other end, don't interact for long. So this story of the C square that is not equal to one is usually very close to the inter inter interaction region. You don't see it very well at the end. If you were to kind of zoom in and add them up, you see some small deviation to of one on the sum of the C square. But basically here, what you see is that this final curve that is here is composed of the first, uh, sorry, the first child, the second Gaussian, plus the second child here. And if I carry on here, we have a very contribution here for this last part. Okay, does that make sense? So each of these Gaussian carries their own population. Yeah, I have a question because in the first trajectory that uh, it, it, it is killed in the, 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 the translation, yeah, it's because it seems like it's going back to the fundamental, uh, the, the minimum structure in the ground state. Yeah, but if you plot the, the trajectory, yeah, it's Feel like very soon, it's not a very close to humanity. Yeah. So what's the criteria there, there to put it so soon? So it's the overlap between the Gaussian. So what is really crazy when you play with the Gaussian is how fast the overlap is X matrix, the overlap of the Gaussian is dropping. It really takes no time for this value. If the Gaussian is enough that the Gaussian just move a bit further away, and it's not just the geometry, it's also the position in there. So it's enough that even if you have stuff that are quite close, if they go in opposite momenta, that's going to be killing the overall overlap, right? So this is really the really super important part here. It's really to realize um, how much this overlap between Gaussian is good in a rather narrow region and narrow period of time, which is why you want to make sure that you have a very good overlap at the moment of the maximum of the non diabetic coupling. And the, the ab initial corresponding is really intended to describe this part properly. Any other effect that you may have in the longer time or, or something like that, or tunneling or whatever, it's not really made for that, right? You really want to describe this very sudden transfer of population with a, a, a rather small Korean sign between these the Gaussian functions properly. But then you let them go. But yeah, they, they did create quite rapidly. So, the, 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 the way this, this removal of the Gaussian is made is that if you see that the, um, the, the overlap between the Gaussian is under a, very, a rather low threshold, I think it's 10 to the minus 4 in the overlap, for more than 400 atomic units, then you kill it. Right? Or, I mean, you don't really kill it, you just mark it for that new part. You can always restart it later on, right? But uh, the overlap uh, decreased uh, in comparison with the time, right? Not with the other child. You will monitor the overlap with all the outside. Okay. Yeah, because that's an important thing is that despite the fact that this one created other functions, Gaussian can be connected by another one. Mm -hmm. So if there is any connection with any Gaussian, you keep it. Okay. Is any overlap. So if, if, if the, this child needs to be really lonely, right? Uh, and so <laughs> <laughs> to be killed. So um, uh, it's on YouTube, right? <laughs> that was the end of my career. Thank you. <laughs> um, so coming back to the coupling, I, I still have a tiny bit of time, right? And uh, yeah, okay, cool. Um, can I just show you this coupling story? Just to kind of see and monitor. Um, if the threshold for the coupling, which is the key aspect that I should really have started with, but okay, if this is adequately chosen. <clears throat> so we want to look at this cup.1 file, which has too many columns, but what you have is time and then the coupling between the state in which you are. I use cup1, that for the first radical basis function, it's net one. <laughs> So the first column is the coupling between the, the ground state and S1 along my trajectory. The second column would be the coupling between F1 and F1, which is equal by zero by definition. And I need to show you that for you to trust me. I mean, hopefully. There we go. So what we have is that uh, this, so this is the coupling 
between one and um, between the ground state and S1, 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 S2. And then what you have here is the other measure, the other metric that we haven't used, which is the normal coupling vector stop product with the velocities of the of the Gaussian. It's basically giving you similar information. Sometimes it might be preferable to kind of use one or the other. And an important thing is that you see that this colon is zero here. This is, oops, this colon here is zero in this part. This is just because when the states are far in energy, you just don't calculate the coupling. The non adiabatic coupling vectors is inversely proportional to the energy between the two states that you couple. In other words, if there is a large energy gap, you know by definition that it's going to be a small quantity. So you only monitor it when the states are coming close, and by close, we still mean, I think, something like one electron volt. So it's quite a large gap here, but you just monitor it at this time. So what you will see here is as we expected, that this cup one here is increasing suddenly at around 500. So let me just cop, uh, plot this. There we go. This is this coupling. Yeah. Why it is it is on zero at time zero? The coupling. Oh, it's just because you need to realize that the gap is there, right? It's a bit like uh, yeah. I mean, it's just like uh, you calculate it during the first time. You say, hey, wait, actually, yeah, yeah, I don't need to calculate it, so it doesn't it doesn't calculate it after. I mean, it, it needs to know it, it needs to know the energy gap so that the electronic such a calculation is done at the same time as the coupling. So you have it for free if you want. I mean, it's not for free, but you have it. I mean, yeah. Okay. So here, this is the norm of the non-electric coupling vectors. So this quantity here for this famous dij, okay, which is a vector, but we just take the norm here along the trajectory basic function one. And what you have is that, as we said, it's zero at the beginning, and then you see it really just spikes one. Two and then yeah. a bit, a bit stubby there. So I think I can do something fancy with GNU plot. Is it three? Can I, oh. can I do? Yes, better. This straight line is the value that we set for our uh, for our coupling threshold three. Okay, um, and what you will see here is that in this particular case. With this three, we can actually capture the coupling here of the main features. Of course, you may be tempted to say, well, might be good to maybe just have to write it at two, right? But if you have it at two, you may actually start to get some other things. You see that you have oscillations here that are still in the region of one or two for this value of the couplings. So here it's really a matter of compromise between efficiency and accuracy. Right, in the sense that, of course, if you put it to seven, eight, that would be a bad idea because you will miss this one, you will miss this one, so you will miss quite a lot of this of this term. But if you set it to three, you will still capture its main peaks, so that might be a best compromise. By experience, it's kind of good to have to make sure that you get all these different features. If you have smaller features that you don't capture, don't worry too much because you will sample some other initial conditions and those one may fix them. Okay. So in average, if you look at one trajectory and see the population along this trajectory for different value of your threshold, you may be horrified because it changes quite a bit, of course, because you basically say you have more normalized events. But if you actually now do the same game for an average of 20 or 30 Gaussian. It's quite crazy to see that the variation is going to be quite small if you are a value that is correct or adequate, like this one. Okay, so this is one of the typical stuff that you want to check, right? And you want to make sure that this is low enough that you capture the features, but high enough that you don't take the noise of the aerobatic stuff, otherwise, you will fail your life in the folding mode, right? Okay. So I think that this is basically most of the cool files that we can monitor. The last one, of course, is to is to kind of look at the actual 
trajectories themselves. So what you have here is the trajectory of, where is it? There we go. So this is your ethylene at time t0. So that's the classical trajectory. So it doesn't have a big meaning. It is just the center of the Gaussian, if you want, right? In a multidimensional space. So it's this dot that I have here. Now in 3 uh, in 3n coordinates, right? So, but basically this is what you have, right? And this is just for this first trajectory basic function. Keep in mind, it always remains on S1, which in itself is not physical because we know that the wave packet will go down, right? Once more, this is not the actual quantity, it is just the support for it. But if we look at what it does, so first of all, at time t0, you can see that it's not, it's not perfectly optimized geometry, right? It's normal, it's coming from a big central geometry. So we've been kind of sampling these different modes to account for the quantum delocalization of your ground state wave function. For and this is one of the examples, right? If you were to kind of overlap 100 of this initial condition, you will have something like that does, does always a nice picture or something like that with all this kind of delocalization. So let's go back to that. So what we see here is a little dense with a lot of things happening, right? But you can really see this kind of now big stretch coupled with a bit of a twist, right? That is taking place on the molecule. You will also see the change in time step. So you see that the dynamics like going fast and then it's like if it lags, right? It just stops. This is because we move from a time step of 20 atomic units. When you enter in the coupling region, it slows down. So every time there's a slowdown here, this is the, 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 the marker that you have this change of time step. Okay, so this is what you would observe for this one. And then if you, if we look, say, let's have a look at the number three, which is the one that from the plot seems to kind of go immediately back to the ground state. So that's the original point. So that's af uh, after the pack propagation. And you see that, boof, you see this one is immediately rah, kind of coming back, right? And you, if you carry on this trajectory, it's just gonna come back to a normal FPA, right? But you see with which pool it wants to kind of come back there. Okay, it's really this one folding down there back to reform the ethylene, right? Okay. So once more, here this is one example of one ace run. What you may want to do at this point, if you had infinite amount of time, would be to create a new directory, or let's say 20 or 30 or whatever new directories. And you can really copy all this set of files that I gave you originally. So this, um, this, all these files that you have here, and in each of your directory, we, you will do a new run, right? Independent run, independent first generation approximation. So a set of Gaussians. So it's a bit like selecting a new Gaussian, a new Gaussian, a new Gaussian. And you let them go, right? And they will go somewhere else over time, right? The only thing you need to change, you keep the files in the very same way. Just change here the seed for the random number generator. You put two, three, your birthday, whatever you want, as long as an integer. Okay. And this will pick another initial condition from this beginner distribution. So you will have another set of position and momenta that will be mimicking this ground state distribution here. So if you just change, I mean, you can give it a try, just put iron equal to, you will see the things that are gonna be completely different, okay? You will have a different trajectory. You collect all this information and then say, if you want to have the average population, you can take all this end of that file and you need to average them, okay? So you have to be careful because due to the change in time step, sometimes you may have that you have more steps in one part than in another initial condition. So you have to kind of put everything on the same grid. There's some interpolation there. It, it, it gets a tiny bit tricky, but it's nothing that you cannot do, right? Uh, but, and then you can really analyze the, the full swarm of this Gaussian function, okay? And that, yeah. And um, the weight of its trajectory is the same? So if you, so within the independent first generation approximation, each eighth run has the very same weight. 
So instead of kind of having different weights for different Gaussian and size to zero, you make them all equal. You just sample them based on this distribution that itself will reproduce these initial states that is of interest. So they have all the same weight. So the average is you have 20, you sum them, the 20, 20. So any quantities that has been integrated over all the Gaussian, right? Mm -hmm. If say now you want to do a plot of all the possible Gauss at the Gaussian, like for example, like the bond length for all of these Gaussian mm -hmm. and compute an expectation value, you need to account for the amplitude for each of these Gaussian with each other. Things get a tiny bit trickier there. So if, if you are interested, so there are a lot of information about that in this book chapter, and I think that is in the Dropbox, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So, so you, you have information here on how you can calculate quantities uh, along trajectories. So it is basically here what in this chapter, what I did was to do a similar analysis than we discussed for ethylene for cyclohexadiene here, right? You can recognize this and the that and the amplitude compared and all these kind of things. So if you want to have a sort of walkthrough, this is, this is just an example of how it works and how you can calculate properties based on that, okay? Does that make sense? I really just wanted to give you a sense for that, but once more, if at some point you fancy using it in the context of your research or for fun and you have any problem, please just drop me an email anytime. Always super excited to kind of talk about this kind of uh, thing, okay? Brilliant. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm going to be around for the coffee, so feel free to come if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you.